please join me in welcoming uh, Raul Pedro Rodriguez, the director of Will of the Wisp, the opening night of Current. Uh, the director of Mutzenbacher, Ruth Beckerman. And the director and one of the stars of Maria Schneider, 1983, Elizabeth Subrin and Isabel Sandoval. So to begin with, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the logic behind bringing you all together. Um, your films are quite disparate, I think, in their effects and in their uh, approaches. Uh, they're all within the, the current section of the festival, which is a, a sort of showcase for really uh, radical works in many different senses of that term. I think uh, there's, a, there's a singularity to all of the films in this lineup that um, unites your work. And I think <clears throat> for the, the purposes of this conversation in particular, I'm interested in how all of your films use a kind of commenting upon questions of sexuality, sexual politics, eroticism, as a way of entering into a dialogue with a certain political or ideological or historical narrative. Uh, and that's a very broad, possibly, uh, possibly too broad umbrella. But in, as, as a viewer, your films uh, really speak to each other, I think. And so I'd like to start by just uh, asking you each uh, to talk a little bit about your work uh, in, in um, ways that I think will get this conversation going. Um, so first of all, as uh, the, the director of the opening night film of the current section, I want to ask Zhao uh, if you could speak a bit about Will of the Wisp. Uh, in your Q&A uh, just a few nights ago, you were asked a question about the relationship between your depiction of sexuality or your, your sort of um, idea of sexuality as it's put forward in Will of the Wisp and how it weaves into the political discourse that undergirds the film. And so I, you, in the Q&A, it, it, um, you were a little bit, um, you didn't necessarily want to lean on that connection. But I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about sexual explicitness within your film and the depiction of uh, sex and bodily organs and um, symbolic and literal uh, phallic imagery and how that all uh, is in a way in conversation with the, whatever this a sort of political or historical narrative is that's at the heart of this story. That's a big question, but if you could just speak a bit about uh, how you thought about politics and sex in uh, play in this film. I'll try. Um, uh, explicitness, uh, uh, do you say it like that? Yeah, uh, it's something that when, since I started making films, I was worried why wasn't sex depicted normally as if other activities of human behavior is like uh, i don't know talking or walking or and um so i i try to to film all these sorts different activities of uh, human uh, behavior not um with no hierarchy somehow um and so, um, because, well, st historically in, the, in film history, there was a lot of censorship. But when I made my first film, I had no censorship. Uh, I could do, I, I've always done the films that I wanted to do. And I told the stories that I wanted to do the way I wanted them to be told. So, and for me, using different, uh, 
choosing what are you, what I'm what I'm showing, what I'm not showing, what I'm is really in the in the core of how storytelling for me is uh, told. Uh, so, but then, and perhaps I, I did a first film in 2000 called the Fantasma that dealt with that directly. And, uh, but then I was also, I didn't want to do that as, I felt that I've already done it. So in this film, it's also very, because there's some explicitness, but there's also in the most explicit scene, there's, there's this question also about um, what you see is fake. So, um, and it's fake, but it's not really fake. But what I try always is to depart from the reality and like the reality of the body, the, the, what you have in front of your, the camera, and then go to some, transcend somehow that reality through fiction. And, uh, and so, and tell a story that perhaps reaches each one of the person that is watching the film or that is seeing the film in a different way. I also not, I try not to, I don't know, not to, I think I shouldn't talk much about my films because, um, no, it's really, because I also don't, I'm, I always try to forget each film in order to be able to to go for forward and move to to another another one so um the films must exist by themselves and just uh and belong to the people who see them somehow now, of course they, I, I know them too well it's also th that i'm trying to get away from them uh, somehow do you see the uh the depiction of sex and of this sort of very celebratory, joyous eroticism in your film as itself political. Do you think your, your film, specifically Will of the Wisp, is an incredibly uh, political text in its treatment of uh, Portuguese history and politics, or po sort of political frameworks. And um, at the same time, it is very joyful in its sort of um, embrace of sexuality. Do you see th that as um, part of the same conversation, or is it? M Go ahead. Uh, perhaps, like in uh, even like going back to that scene that is, I don't know, the scene that is more explicit. It's also about how you deal with politics in your in an intimate context. So, and perhaps that is really the question: how, uh, and so that in somehow that scene is crucial to understand all the rest of politics of the, the rest of the film and historical uh, context uh, of because, well, it's a, it's a story of a, a prince that falls in love with a firefighter and, uh, and wants to become a firefighter. And, and, uh, but a prince, a prince that, of a monarchy that doesn't exist since 1910 because we don't have a monarchy since 1910. But, um, but it represents the whole, almost the whole history of Portugal being called Portugal because Portugal was created as a country by a king in the 12th century, uh, 11th century even. So uh, it represents the most of the history of Portugal as if this character, the, the prince, but it's also a fairy tale character, has on its back all the somehow not that you feel it or not that i want to put it on but because he's the inheritor of the of um, a lineage uh, that ruled portugal somehow he represents that and he's in face of someone that comes from a very different origin uh, socially uh, and so there's this class, not just the the question of history, but all like this class uh, um, confrontation uh, in the film. I want to uh, pick up on uh, a, a phrase you used, which was uh, pol politics in an intimate context, which I think beautifully encapsulates um, 
sort of the thinking behind bringing you all together. And I want to turn to Ruth. And um, Ruth, in your Q&A last night, you spoke about your motivation for uh, embarking on the, the sort of experiment of Mutzenbacher, which involved uh, putting out a casting call for men aged 16 to 99 uh, with or without acting experience to take part in a film project or to audition for a film project related to uh, this work of erotic fiction, pornographic fiction from the turn of the 20th century. And your interest in setting up this experiment had to do with wanting to hear from men about their views and attitudes and feelings and experiences of sexuality and of their own sexuality and of as as sort of reflected back to them in this work of literature. Uh, and I wonder if you could just talk a bit about whether you see that as a political project as well as a, a sort of a personal, exploratory, intimate way of, of um, drawing these narratives out of these men, if that question makes sense. Of course, it's a, does this work? OK. Um, of course, it's a political project. And I mean, your title says politics of desire. I think there is more politics today in desire than desire, if you understand what I mean, around. So and that's um, quite annoying in many ways. And I think it's also quite dangerous um, because, as we know from history, when politics gets involved in private life, um, this ends up in very unpleasant dictatorships. Uh, if people tell you what, with whom you're allowed to have sex or how many children you're allowed to have and so on and so on, so I think we are right in the middle of this today from several sides, not only one. And um, of course, when you make a film, you always uh, do it in your own time. So I made this film a year ago, and it's kind of a response, uh, not, a, not a militant and not a, um, ideological or explicit response what's going on and so of course it's a political film. I, uh, Joao also mentioned um, sort of a, a question of representation and the idea of, of a person standing in for an idea or a an institution in the in the story uh, at least I think that was that was sort of part of what you were saying uh, the, the way that in, in Will of the Wisp, Alfredo sort of stands for more than just his own embodied identity. And I, so I was wondering if, uh, Ruth, you could talk a bit about your restriction. So it, in Mutzenbacher, it's a film in which there's a great deal of talking about sex. Uh, and there's also ele an element of corporeal presence with these men who we see on screen who are very... Uh, the, the, the camera really lingers with their bodily presence. And then the only two women, as we, you discussed in your Q&A last night, the only two women who figure in the film are yourself and uh, Josephine Mutzenbacher, the, the narrator and subject of the text. And so I wonder if you could just talk about that decision to show the men as embodied and talking about sex and, and reciting these very uh, explicit and, and sort of um, provocative literary passages, coupled with these absent women figures who are not embodied in the film. And if that had to do with uh, a commentary of sorts on the relationship between men and women. Well, actually, it's a film about men, men today. And as you said, there are two women, the one character of the porn book, Josephine Mutzenbacher and me. And um, men read uh, parts, excerpts of the book, and they 
most of the time uh, read passages when um, of a woman. If you understand what I mean, I mean a woman who has sex and moans and uh, I don't know has several words uh, for all kinds of, of techniques and so on, but it's a man who reads it. So um, this was important for me to reverse the roles in, in many ways. I mean, the men sit on a casting couch, usually young women, or many times young women sit on a casting couch and try to impress a male director. In this film, they try to impress me. And for the spectator, you don't see me, you just hear my voice, because I think a part of eroticism is, is fantasy and not uh, images and not seeing everything, but just having your own fantasies. That's why, in my opinion, porn books are more interesting than images, but people, some people say there's a difference between men and women. women. I don't know if that's true. Um, I didn't make research in that sense, in that direction, but um, yeah, as I said, there is um, this casting couch, which is in at the same time um, a casting couch, but also makes you think about Sigmund Freud and the Freudian couch, because these men sit there and speak about their fantasies or their sexual life. And um yeah what was uh, your question <laughs> <laughs> i guess it's just <laughs> <laughs> but probably you didn't see the film you can see the film tomorrow at 9 p.m so i it doesn't make much sense to talk about the film people haven't seen but, um, well i think the auction uh, the the images that are out or what happens outside the frame is as important as what you see. And I always try to make films with at least the least image quantity of images possible. And I think that sound and language and film has so many other aspects. And we live in, in a time where we are overwhelmed with images. And I think it's much more interesting to reduce the quantity of images to make you look more to focus on the ones you see. And that's, a, a, I think, a, a perfect uh, point to turn to Elizabeth uh, to speak about her film, uh, Maria Schneider, 1983, <laughs> which has not screened yet. It will be screening in a few days uh, prior to. It, it's a, a short film that accompanies a feature in the Currents program. Uh, but it's really a, a, a fascinating work in its interpretation of uh, a French television interview with the actress Maria Schneider about 11 or 12 years after the production of Last Tango in Paris, which uh, involved uh, sort of an infamous incident of a uh, simulated rape scene that was essentially enacted on Maria Schneider without her knowledge or consent in advance. And the interview uh, touches on the film in a very, um, in a way that doesn't directly reference this thing that happened to her on the set of the film, but uh, the the nature of her speech uh, sort of ends up creating an image of the trauma and exploitation that she's undergone without showing it and without even explicitly alluding to it. Uh, and in the in your film. Uh, you select three actresses to recreate that interview. And uh, the three actresses are each on screen in an uninterrupted segment, uh, one after the other, and the interviewer is not seen. Uh, so in some ways, structurally, it, it has a lot in common with Mutzenwacher, I think, using this uh, sort of documentary text, or not, in one case, literary text, in another case, transcript of an interview uh, to sort of build this space in which to think about what's not being said in the text, what's implied by the text. And in this case, what's implied is exploitation. It's this, this ab abusive uh, relationship between an actress and 
the film production that she was a part of and the people who exercised power over her in that production. So I wonder if you could just sort of talk a bit about um, your your work has has consistently been very overtly uh, feminist in its orientation and its uh, sort of approach. Uh, and could you talk about how you see this project as uh, a work of feminism or a um, part of that feminist project? Um, how does it relate to feminism? So um, this film was, in a way, came out of the last feature I made, uh, which was about an actress um, who wanted to get out of the industry. And um, that came out of uh, a blog that I wrote for a few years called Who Cares About Actresses, which was kind of a way to take like explicit politics out of this imminent project. And because I don't like to be explicit, I don't, I'm not making agitprop, I'm making art. So, so I guess, um, I think the the feminism of it is pretty obvious, but I what I would add is in, in terms of it dealing with kind of what I might even say is sadism, um, is that the dynamic between Maria and the the interviewer as well is a very subtle, uh, very subtle manipulation. So I'm kind of speaking about both what happens before a film is made, what happens after um, and during. So I mean, if people don't know who Maria Schneider is, she was the star of a film called Last Tango in Paris, where she at 19 years old played across from Marlon Brando. Um, and so there was already a really kind of obscene power dynamic between the two of them. And the issue in the scene, which uh, was that it was non-consensual, and uh, the director, Bernardo Bertolucci, basically didn't trust her to perform, or that's what he said. Um, and he said he wanted her to react as a girl, not as an actress. So there were elements of the scene, of the rape scene, which was anal penetration simulated, um, involving butter, which she wasn't told about. So in contemporary legal terms, at least in the US, although not yet in France, it is rape. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. Um, I think the way I would say it's feminist besides the obvious ways, which is that she's resisting um, the demands of the interviewer in many ways, even somebody pointed out even her sight lines are really incredible because she's, she spends a lot of time not looking at the journalist and spends a lot of time refusing to speak, which are all like kind of contrary to the kind of obedience of an actress. Um, but also the actresses that I cast, I chose explicitly because they all speak to issues of gender um, and uh, I guess, sexism and the patriarchy, not only in their work, but also as um, as actors and in Isabella and Aisa's case as directors as well, in terms of contemporary political issues and in without, I appreciate you not spoiling the film, but each, each performance, there was a degree of collaboration where I asked them in different ways to infuse their own experience. And I think Isabel, can talk about this in her own films and also in our collaboration that, um, I, I, you know, sometimes when I, we were rehearsing or even on set, I would say, do you think right now you're responding as a perform, like your performances, are you reacting to the journalist questions to you as an actor, to you and your experience in the industry, or are you reacting to your feelings about Maria? Like, are you Maria, are you you, you know? So um, as the film progresses, uh, um, the power of their perspectives 
continue as well um, in a way that I think is bringing it um, to now. And I guess the only other thing I'd say is like in a conversation about the politics of de desire, kind of like you were talking about, Ruth, that it's it feels so unsensual, <laughs> like the way we're talking, it doesn't feel sexy. Um, but I think also in the production, I mean, Maria was incredibly desired. She became a sex symbol and um, she's exquisite. And I think part of the power of her sexuality and why she became a global sex symbol besides her incredible body and the explicit sex was that she, she was queer and she didn't need men. And the, the kind of, the lack of need in her performances and uh, The Passenger and Rene Clement's films, I mean, that, you know, I worked really hard to make the film as sensual as possible too, so that that tension. So I think, I mean, in a way it's a critique of eroticism, but it's also, uh, it's not denying the actor's sensuality. I uh, want to pick up on that with Isabel and to ask you, Isabel, um, both from your perspective as a filmmaker in your own right, uh, who has spoken a great deal about sensuality in cinema and, and used it in your work uh, in, in fascinating ways uh, and surprising and, and diverging ways. In this film, you are uh, in the role of it, your your performance. Your it, your contribution is your performance, your embodiment of Maria Schneider, who is both a character and a real person who worked and had these experiences in the field that you also practice. And so, did you? I would say, I guess, how uh, how would you approach that task differently when you're being called upon to actually embody? that person and and um what do, what do you what do you bring to that process yeah i think it's very fascinating actually that we're uh maria schneider's premiering within a week after blonde <laughs> <laughs> came out um but you know embodying or channeling uh maria schneider for this film in a way although we were are both actors my experience is very different in that the films I have so far acted in are independent productions. They're my own films that I've also directed. And so I, I have I exercised pretty much full creative control and autonomy about how I and the character that I'm portraying uh, will be represented, um, which is quite different, very different from what you experienced, particularly in Last Tango in Paris, which incidentally actually had its world premiere 50 years ago here at the New York Film Festival. Yeah. Um, and so as I was playing Maria, I think it is a performance. You know, there is a certain detachment. But I was also, I think, because of her experience um, and the experience of a lot of women, a lot of actresses that have experienced abuse, you know, in the industry. Um, both an equal measure of wisdom and wariness about what it is to work as a female identifying performer in the industry and the possibility of being abused and misrepresented. So that was what I was essentially trying to portray. Um, in my segment of Maria Schneider, 1983. And it's also interesting because the dramatic impulse in this film is quite different from my own. My characters tend to be very reticent and taciturn and elusive. But here, I'm trying to talk about my segment without spoiling it, Elizabeth. Um, there is a pushback. I think um, a resistance to not just the abuse that she in experienced in the hands of the filmmakers of, of Last Tango, but the continued violation by the media 
years on, and this you know interview happened 11 years after the fact, to essentially reduce her and condemn her to a fate of victimhood and tragedy. And this is, and I think the common thread between my own films and how I portray characters or minorities and Maria Schneider here is the reclaiming of agency and dignity through our own words. I think that also ties in um, in fascinating ways with Mutzenbacher, which uh, is built on the words of a character who is a fictional character, but I think takes on uh, a presence, a sort of a outsized presence in your film, Ruth, um, by way of her words. And it is she is a fabrication uh, of, a, of an anonymous author, the author of this work of literature was never credited, although it, it sounds as though it's suspected to be a man. Um, and so it's, uh, in your film, we have men reading the words of a presumably male author, but a, a female character, a woman who is, you know, being, uh, she's very young, she's a teenager, uh, who, a kid. a kid, she's a child. She's And it, it's, a, it's a sort of a fictional memoir of her sexual initiation uh, on her way to um, becoming a, a sex worker. And uh, it's very, um, in, in some ways, very dark and in some ways uh, very startling, the, the sort of interplay of, of humor and lightness with the darkness. And so I guess I just wondered if you could speak about her as a character and how you see uh, her figuring in your efforts to draw out these men and draw them into this story and by doing so learning about them, the men who you have on the casting couch. Well, it's, uh, of course she's a character, but she's an invention. She's a fictional character one should not forget that some of the men thought that this is a documentary, was a, that she herself had written this book, which is of course not true, but it was written in the tradition of a female memoir. So the author um, wrote a book in the first person of a woman who remembers as an elderly woman her childhood and how she started to have sex very young and how she had I don't know how many men and wanted to fuck most of the time she was ready to have sex. Of course this is um, this is porn and it's the special thing about this book it, it, that it's very well written and very well constructed and very funny in a way and um, uses language in, in a very unusual way and that was also one focus of mine to, to, to get back to this Viennese language of 100 years ago and the variety of expressions. Um, I hope that was well translated in the subtitles. <coughs> yeah, so... Uh, but of course, my intention was to use this uh, book as a trigger for men or a variety of men today to speak about themselves. So every man who came in and, and sat on my casting couch had to read a, an extract of the book. That's how it started. Even if not, all the reading is in the film, of course. But that was the trigger to um, shock them in a way because they didn't know that they are going to read uh, this kind of, of, of text, a porn text. And uh, most of the time I had two men together on the couch. So quite naturally they started to talk with each other after reading. Or sometimes there was only one and then I talked to me. Yeah? So that was, that was the whole idea. We, we put out a casting call looking for men uh, between the age of 16 and 99 and around 150 men applied and I invited half of the half of them 
to come to the casting. That was a very simple idea, but it worked. It's, it's, I like experiments and I like to be surprised. And I was quite surprised that men were so frank to talk. Because uh, women usually say, or my friends say, that men don't talk about themselves. And I found out that it's not true. They talked and they were quite um, diverse. They were, there was a variety of, of attitudes and the, quite a big difference between older men and young men, I think. I mean, you, you can feel that uh, young, and there were very young men in the film also, that they had another attitude, another consciousness, uh, different mothers already, and they, they had a, uh, a more open-minded approach to talking about sex and um, how they, yeah, how they, um, on one, but not, that's not so true. They also have problems because they grow up with the internet. So at a very young age already, they are confronted with all kinds of images you find in the internet. And that's, uh, one man says that in the film, that's also quite problematic because you don't have a book, a text, and you have your own fantasies, but you're confronted with images, very exact images, how uh, sex should be performed. And then you have the feeling as a young man, you have to do it the same way. So there are new problems coming up today. But the difference between generations was the most interesting uh, thing I found out while making the film. Speaking of the generational differences and also the um, <clears throat> aspect of, of Josephine Muslimbacher's story that is presented as a memoir as an older woman looking back on her youth, on her initiation, that's uh, also s sort of a, a common thread with Will o' the Wisp. Um, as you mentioned, Joao, it's uh, the, the sort of framing stories that it's a, an old king, a dying king, reminiscing about uh, his sort of sort of coming of age essentially it's a coming of age story and a, a a a story about a young man who has a desire to become a firefighter uh for for sort of righteous um youthful reasons of of perhaps rebelling against uh, his family's expectations or his his social class's expectations um, and in doing so he both recognizes his own desire uh for uh, one of his fellow firefighters that then sort of uh, propels the story forward, their, their sort of love story, uh, and at the same time becomes politically aware and politically sort of activated. And um, there's a moment in the film where um, I, Afonso says that um, in order to defend the forest, we must desire the forest. And... I think that that is uh, kind of at the heart of the film, this idea that political activism and sort of sexual initiation and joy come from the same kind of desire. Would you say that that's, um, would you say that that was sort of the, the the reason for the fairy tale fantastical approach that you took was that related to this idea of wish fulfillment essentially or desire the fulfillment of desire um, i think the film is this, it's really the story of uh, the first love a coming of age story sort of first love a coup de foudre i don't know how do you say coup de foudre in, Bolt of lightning and in, in in english um that changes the life of a character. But I think the fairy tale aspect of the film was, uh, you have to, to understand that the film is a comedy and it's a fantasy, and there's a lot of irony in the film. So it's always playing in me several meanings and several layers of meanings. So it's not to take it for as it is, uh, like the, because how can you tell uh, when I discovered, it, actually it was based on a real story, that our this our hair, hair of the crown 
even if it doesn't mean anything anymore in Portugal, wanted to be a firefighter. Uh, so our prince in commas wanted to be a firefighter. And I thought, how can I tell this story without being, I, I cannot t tell it in a serious way. It doesn't make sense. It's so, so out of the, the reality. So I, that's how I, I went, we went when we wrote the, the film in the direction of like the, the, the fairy tale, the, the how you, it's a, it's a story of a, a prince and no princesses. There's no princess, there's two, because there's two men. But um, uh, then all the layers of the, about, um, how do you say uh, the, the the fire the the forest fires the climate change the the, the political uh, the, the, the history of Portugal uh, the historical context of Portugal come in a I mostly uh, ironizing about about it those all those questions uh, and even like the the, the prince he's a little bit because you really see him growing up the film starts into well it starts in 2069 but goes back to 2011 so it tells the story of uh, a very long story in a very short time and so i had to really choose in the storytelling how what i what i was going to show what i was uh, to tell that story in a in in this condensed uh, amount of time and uh, and that is always the question, and going back to the the explicitness about uh, the, that you, you you mentioned in the beginning, film is always it's images and sounds, and it's always a question about what you show, what you do not show, what stays outside of the frame, what stays inside of the frame, and so it's always a question of choice, and that choice comes out of my it's sort of it's my point of view, it's the way I have to that I found to relate to other people somehow. And it's to tell these stories that are usually come, they come from reality because I'm, well, it's what we have, it's the world we live in. It's so I'm inspired by that and my own experience. But, but then it's all about fiction. And so it's, it's that, that in the film, there's this idea this classical idea of a, a memoir, uh, someone t telling or someone remembering his early ages and um, when he's old and when he's almost on the ver on the um, almost dying and then he eventually dies. So uh, yeah. Well, I have I have more questions of my own, but I want to open it up to the audience in case there are any questions in the audience. Um, I see we have one right over there. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, Philippine art art house Philippine cinema for the last fifty years has essentially been defined, you know, starting with Lina Broca's work. Um, has been anchored or rooted in a kind of social realist orientation. Of course, with Brillante Mendoza and Lab Diaz, Mendoza especially, it's evolved into kind of a near gritty, neo realist um, aesthetic. Uh, what I attempt to do in my own work, you know, having kind of grown up in a social realist, um, with a socialist perspective, and this is most evident now in Lingua Franca, is you know infusing themes that have strongly political underpinnings with a sensibility that's uh, more sensuous and lyrical and and poetic. Um, I'd like to think. I think you know in terms of the future of Philippine cinema is to really explore you know, a different style or aesthetic sensibility um, besides social realism. I feel like there are a lot of emerging and burgeoning um, Filipino tours and filmmakers that have kind of used realism as a crutch in a way. Um, and it's quite 
unsettling and disturbing in a way, um, and that it's being used disingenuously um, in order to get programmed by prestigious international film festivals, you know, the likes of Cannes, Berlin, and Venice, of course, and I'm talking about like this phenomenon called poverty porn. Um, and I've you know, having been in that circle, you know, some time ago, I I know that that happens. Um, and I think that's led to a kind of creative and political bankruptcy in a way. And I think today more than ever, having just come from the, dictator the dictatorship of Duterte and now re-entering the Marcus era, um, 50 years after the father was the dictator of the Philippines, now his son has just been elected president of the Philippines. And so it's very important, I think, for Filipino filmmakers to really explore um, a new mode or, or approach creatively and artistically to tackle what is happening in our, in our country. Um, if you know, social realism and new realism is being co-opted by the current administration as Brillante Mendoza was. Um, and I'm so, so excited that we now have filmmakers um, like the filmmakers of Leonor Will Never Die, for instance, that are charting a new path, I think, aesthetically um, to redefine and reinvent the Philippine cinema of the future. I think we have time for one other question. The question was about um, sort of the uh, uh, American mainstream version of desire and, and sort of sexuality generally, I th yeah. take that to mean, and just what your perspective is on that coming from uh, very different cultures, uh, both filmically and personally. Anyone has a perspective? <laughs> I mean, um, as the, uh, I guess, U.S. born, um, I think all my work has been included, and my feature really is about exactly that, is like what mainstream Hollywood does to women in particular, but I guess the most kind of uh, provocative thing I could say, which I also think is just true, is that uh, we love rape in this country. We do love rape because if you look at dominant Hollywood, if you look at the history of American mainstream cinema, and especially if you look at TV, rape is super popular. And there's no way to get around that. And like my students always get really like shocked and freaked out when I say that, but I'm like, it's, it's uh, Hollywood is a market. That is fundamentally what it is. And so if, rape did not sell if people didn't want to see rape we wouldn't have it so i guess you know when you think of something like i haven't seen blonde yet but it's getting totally trashed which is pleasurable to me <laughs> um <laughs> so I, I from an american perspective like that's that <laughs> I'm happy that I don't have to live up to this Americanist <laughs> perspective. Uh, I, I'll just, but also, if you see, like mainstream American cinema is the one that you see all over the world. So I don't know. I, I think we, at least I was in my country, Portugal. It's this, the films that you mostly see. So it's, I don't think we have a, a sort of like a different approach uh, approach in the sense a different view out of i just you, mostly i don't see it uh, I, I don't know it's also very large what do you what is american mainstream cinema it's quite different also the uh, or and what it was before and what it is now um, um. I think it's very interesting that there's, you know, a very particular kind of sex, a heteronormative 
sex that's permitted and per perpetuated um, in mainstream Hollywood product essentially um, we hear about movies by Marvel you know where if they're gonna be released in the Middle East we can't have you know like the suggestion of or let alone explicit scenes of you know queer desire or queer sex so I think you know there is one kind of sex that supports you know the the systems that we really have in place the patriarchal that becomes perpetuated in, term, in the name of capitalism. Um, what I try to do as uh, an independent queer filmmaker, at least in my own work, is to you know, allow for my characters to have agency in expressing and articulating and manifesting that desire um, because just by the depiction of it, it's already a transgression of what is allowed and what is seen in American cinema. Um, that is what I try to do, at least. Well, I think that's a, a, a great note to end on, and we are out of time. So um, thank you all so, so much, and thank you all for joining us.